Welcome to episode number 46 of the Better With Brock podcast. And today's episode, we are going to be talking about fat loss myths. Lately on social media, I have been pushing back on a lot of the BS that personal trainers or fitness influencers, my favorite, have been posting just absolute nonsense, workouts, nutrition advice that just literally isn't true, which you could label as misinformation. I've been pushing back against these pieces of content, these messages that they're pushing and they're just incorrect. And today, uh, I'm going to do the same for fat loss myths. This isn't directed at anyone. It's just literally directed at these fat loss myths that are going around. People have so much to say for fat loss. You should try this. You should try that. Oh my God, I did this and I lost 10 kg in five weeks. You need to do it as well. So let's get to the bottom of these myths. I'm going to explain why the myths exist and the potential ideas as to why they've been pushed. And then I'm going to debunk them step by step so you can not waste time doing these things to try and achieve fat loss. And then at the end of the podcast, I'm going to be revealing the best way to lose fat, in my opinion, which is going to be backed by research, which is a good thing. Keep in mind, it's not just about backing things up by research. It's also about backing things up with anecdotal experience as well. As a personal trainer, I spent five years on the gym floor. I've now been coaching people online since 2019, end of 2019. So coming up four years at the end of this year, which isn't actually too far away, quite scary. And then I'm going to close out the podcast, but I will give you the answer at the end of the podcast. So make sure you stay to the end. Let's dive into it. The first fat loss myth that we're going to cover is high reps and low weight for fat loss. Or people would also say high reps and low weight to tone your body. Toning, yeah. That word, toning, just, it's it's still around in 2023. I don't know how people still use it to market their gyms or their programs. It's crazy. Sometimes I'll say it to relate to people that have used it first, but if they don't say it first, I usually don't lead with toning because what does that actually mean? It just means build muscle and drop body fat at the same time. And maybe it's a fast way to explain the goal, but it's more of a, I would say it's more of a marketed towards female word. I feel like they really buy into that or they used to. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you think that. If not, then maybe I'm just I'm just crazy. But anyway, high reps and low weight. Now, this was pushed because people think that lifting higher reps and doing lower weight is going to burn more calories because you're exerting more energy and you're heart rate is higher and you're sweaty and it just fe- it just feels like fat loss. I don't know if you've trained like this before, but it does feel like you're losing fat. I remember when I lived in Auckland, I used to wake up at sunrise and do boot camps and I felt like I was losing fat just from the, you know, we would wa- our warm up was 100 burpees. We'd do 10 burpees, we'd take a little rest, five, five seconds, 10 seconds, do 10 more burpees, five seconds, 10. We'd do 100 burpees just for a warm up. And then we would go into doing crazy things like just, you know, running around this park, doing push-ups on the curb, doing lunges around trees, doing all these types of things. And back then I thought I was smashing it. I was absolutely burning fat. I was a fat burning machine. But the truth is I was just sweating. I was moving a lot and I'm not taking away from these things. It's, it's important that you move. It's important that you exercise. It's, it's great physically, also mentally, socially as well. There's a lot of people doing that boot camp. but just because you're sweating and doing lots of things does not mean that you're losing fat. And just because you're doing heaps of reps and lighter weight doesn't mean that you're losing fat either. When we lose fat, we do that through creating a calorie deficit. And that can be by moving more, 
right? There's this saying, move more and eat less. That's how you lose body fat. Very, you know, very general. It's not wrong, but it also doesn't help many people because it's so broad. It's like, okay, move more. What does that mean? Do I walk more? Do I do I jump around? Do I dance? Do I lift weights? Do I do CrossFit? What do I do? And then eat less. Okay, what does that mean? Do I eat less meals? Do I eat less food? Do I eat less protein? What does that mean? If you understand what it means, eat less, move more is pretty solid advice, but it just needs to be broken down a little bit. But anyway, we we, we need to create a calorie deficit to lose body fat. And the way that we exercise shouldn't change. We should just continue to train the same, especially if we're lifting weights. We should just continue to train close to failure, doing simple, basic exercises that have stuck around for years. Squats, bent over rows, pull-ups, overhead presses, bench presses, push-ups, chest press machine, lat pull-down, seated row, leg extension, leg curl, standing calf raise, all these exercises that have been around for ages because they've earned the respect of peoples and science, they should be done close to failure. And that's how we should be treating our training. And we should be losing body fat through our nutrition, which is through creating a calorie deficit, eating less calories than we burn per day. And when we do that, there is this discrepancy between the two, which is the calorie deficit, the gap in between. And that's how we lose body fat the calorie deficit. So with our training, if we go from, let's just say you lift weights, you're lifting weights normally, yeah man, heavy bench bro, and you're just, you know, doing your training and then you're like, oh, I'm doing fat loss. Take those 20 plates off. I need to do, instead of doing 120 kilos, I'm gonna do 16, do 40 reps. So now you're just doing a weight that's so easy, you can do so many reps, and then you eat in a calorie deficit, and what happens? You're gonna lose your muscle mass because you're now just lifting weights that aren't challenging you enough. You can maintain your muscle mass, you can get a muscle building response from any rep range between three reps and 30. However, sometimes when you do higher reps, 20 reps, 30 reps, those reps that get you to those reps at the end that are close to failure, I'd say you could speed up the process just by doing somewhere between, I don't know, three to 20, that number, like anything more than that is, I feel like you're just kind of the first 27 reps that don't really hurt. You're like, oh, you know, could that time be better used just resting and maybe just lifting a bit of a heavier weight? I think so. So lifting higher reps and doing lower weight Okay, look, you may expend slightly more calories in a workout session. If you just lifted weights normally, let's just say you burnt 300 calories. If you did lighter weights and lower, uh, sorry, lighter weights and heaps of reps, okay, you might sweat more, you might feel more fatigued, you might have a higher heart rate, you might feel it more challenging for your cardio, you might... um, expend maybe 50 calories more, 100 calories more. Let's say this is being super generous. And if you burn that extra 50, 100 calories, is that really worth it? Because now you haven't really applied progressive overload because you're doing these higher, you know, higher reps, lower weight. So you're not getting any PRs. Um, You're not really getting stronger. When So that means that you could potentially lose muscle mass. Okay, you might lose weight, but you want to hold on to your hard-earned muscle. There's a saying. The training that we do to build muscle is the same that we do to maintain muscle in a calorie deficit. So don't change your training. Don't go to high reps and low weight because that is a recipe for losing your muscle mass. You might lose weight, but you're losing muscle as well. And what we want to do, because muscle is so hard to build, especially as you get more advanced and, you know, even as an intermediate person, like you don't build very much muscle. So you want to do as much as you can to try and maintain it. And changing modalities or strategies, methods in the gym 
going high reps and low weight is not a great way to maintain that muscle mass. And maintaining your muscle mass is what makes you look shredded. Like there's, okay, losing weight where you're looking lean, but if you want to look shredded, which is what most people do, that is because you have muscle mass underneath that fat. And when you lose that fat, you need to hold on to that muscle mass because that gives you that shredded look. That gives you that wow factor like, oh, that person's muscular. Because there are skinny people, and this isn't me saying skinny people aren't doing good. Skinny people uh, is not the body that we want to go for. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, most people that listen to this podcast and follow me in general are trying to, to look their best. And when we look at physiques that we admire, that may inspire us, that may be a hashtag fitspiration, they're often shredded. And that is a low body fat percentage with a high muscle mass for their body, usually. That's what makes you stand out because it's quite hard to achieve. And it's hard to achieve because there's so many fat loss myths that are around. So that's the first one. High reps and low weight, don't do it. Keep training normally. And if you normally train high reps and low weight, maybe you should think of considering lifting heavier weights for slightly less reps with slightly longer rest periods and getting stronger and lifting close to failure. So you could have more muscle mass. And then when you cut next time, you can reveal it and have an even more outstanding physique, which is what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to level up our physique. This is the Better With Brock podcast better right and if you like i get a lot of pushback on social media sometimes where people are like oh you know but it's better than doing nothing like high reps and low weight look at least they're training at least yeah look that's very obvious i get that i'm not trying to preach to those people if you're lifting for fun and you know oh, i love this and yeah i get to meet my friend sally at the gym and we train together that's awesome but that's just not really my style. I don't really enjoy that sort of training. Pump class, um, F45, it's fun. I get it. It's social, it's cool, but that's not how you take your physique to the next level. And that's what I'm interested in. So just don't waste your air on those comments. Don't like, <laughs> yeah, Brock, but at least they're training. Yeah, cool. Thumbs up, clap, clap. I'm very happy for that person, but I'm more interested in about how to take that person that just can't lose fat or that just has hit that plateau and they just can't get out of there. I'm very interested in getting that person to the next level, not from zero to one. It's more so from 50 to 60 to 75 to 100. That's what I'm interested in. That's the journey. All right. I digress a little bit there. Okay. Fat loss, low carb diets. Let's break these down. Low carb diets seem to be the People's choice. It's the first thing that people think of when they want to lose fat. Ah, oh, I need to I need to drop my carbs. I need to stop eating this and stop eating that. Stop eating bread. I'm just gonna stop eating rice. I'm even gonna stop eating fruit. I'm gonna stop all the stuff because then I'm gonna lose fat. And you know, there's some people that do it because they wanna stop their insulin spiking because insulin spiking leads to fat storage. That's not true. And then there's people that want to lower carbohydrates just simply because they think carbohydrates are bad. And they think that it makes them bloat and maybe they do. And it makes them feel sluggish, makes them feel bad. And with that, it's, it's, it's very individual. Personally, I thrive off carbohydrates. I love them. I train better. I think better. I operate better. I sleep better. And then I've trained some people that don't function well on them. They get, they do get sluggish. They get, you know, in the afternoon, they feel like they need a coffee. Um, they feel a bit bloated. They feel hungry. Like they want to just keep eating after they have carbohydrates. So... Let me just break down how, I guess, how it became popular. And, 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 and it could stem from, you know, sugar being bad. Sugar is the devil. Sugar being like the worst thing. Like it was fat for a while, 
back in the day. Everything low fat, you know, dodge fat. Fat is bad. Fat makes you fat. If you eat fat, you get fat. You know, that was quite popular. And then it was like, sugar is the devil. Uh, but then they were like, oh, man, but then now we can't sh- uh, sell cereal. So better change it. We better think of something else. Hmm, what can we do? Um, but sugar is carbohydrates, really, when we break it down. Um, but let's talk about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are just one of the fuel sources that we use in our body. We have proteins, we have fats, and then we also have carbohydrates. And it's it's a fuel source that has its own role. Um, you know, like we could look at our overall calories into different fuels. Maybe, you know, protein is diesel, carbohydrates are premium unleaded, and fat is, I don't know, oil. <laughs> and they all kind of like have their own purpose with what they do in our bodies. And carbohydrates are actually key for us. They help us perform better. It's our preferred energy system for our brain. And often when people go low carbohydrate, it's not the fact that they've gone low carbohydrate. It's the fact that they've lowered their calorie intake through lowering their carbohydrate intake. So going low carbohydrate can drop body fat but ultimately if you go low carbohydrate and then you don't replace them with any other foods that means your calorie intake is going to go down and then what we talked about before you're going to create a calorie deficit and that is the only way that you're going to lose fat so low carbohydrate doesn't really do that because if your calories are the same and your protein is the same and you have high carbs low fat or high fat, low carb, researchers showed time and time and time again that you lose a pretty similar amount of fat as long as your calories are creating a calorie deficit and your protein is high or maintained. Like if you you go low carbohydrate um, and create a calorie deficit and then go high carbohydrate and uh, don't create a calorie deficit, like, yeah, you're not going to lose weight. But it's not because you had higher carbohydrates. It's because you had a higher calorie intake. With fat loss, calories are king. So it doesn't matter what your calories are made up of. If they're too high, they're too high. So that is the first principle that you must get correct. If you have low carbs, high carbs, low fat, high fat, high protein, low protein, it doesn't matter. If your calories are too high, you will not lose body fat. Like if you pour too much water into a cup, it's going to overflow. There's no way to get around that. It doesn't matter what you put in the cup. You can pour juice in, you can pour milk in, you can pour water in. If there's too much of the stuff, it's going to overflow. And it's the same thing with fat loss. If you're just eating protein, carbohydrates, fats at whatever ratios you want to, but it's too much in general, the cup's going to overflow and that is your fat overflowing and then getting deposited in your body fat. You're going to gain weight. So that's a good analogy for you to keep in mind. But often, like I said before, when people lower their carbohydrates, they often lower their calorie intake and they don't replace it with other foods. They just go, oh man, I, I've, I've stopped eating bread and I'm losing weight. Like this low carb thing really works. And to most people, they would go, yeah, man, that's crazy. Bread's the worst. But it wasn't bread. It was the calories. Because now instead of having a ham, sorry, bacon and egg sandwich for breakfast, you just have bacon and eggs and avocado. Let's say it's a bit of a keto breakfast. Don't get me started on keto. We'll get there soon. And you're like, man, I feel great. I've, I've, I've been losing weight. You know, I've stopped having my two pieces of sourdough with with butter on it every morning. And I just have bacon and eggs and avocado. And instead of having a sandwich at lunch, I have a salad. It's the same thing, but I just don't have the bread. Um, and I've lo- like over the last two weeks, I've lost weight. It's crazy, man. Bread's the devil. Bread's not the devil. Eating too many calories is the devil for fat loss. For fat loss. So... If you're going low carbohydrate, 
you may reduce your calorie intake and create a calorie deficit and then lose fat. But it wasn't because the carbohydrates were lower, it was because your calories were lower. And another thing to tack on to carbohydrates is with going low carbohydrate, you retain less water in general because carbohydrates, uh, when we consume them, they convert into our, our glycogen stores, which we use for physical activity, for training and stuff like that. So when we have less carbohydrates or a, let's say a low carbohydrate diet, our glycogen stores are often depleted. And with depleted glycogen stores, uh, we, are, we, we just carry less water. And if we carry less water, we're going to weigh less. And that's why when people start a diet and they go, I'm going to go low carbohydrate. And then they start on Monday and it's Thursday and they're like, man, I've lost three kilos. I've, I, I haven't been able to lose three kilos in three years. And now it's taken me three days. I've lost three kilos. Low carbohydrate diet is hashtag the best. I feel amazing. All this kind of stuff. Um, but really, it's just water. It's probably not body fat. It may have been if you created a calorie deficit, but don't mistake the two, right? So one thing you can actually test this with, which I've done many times, if you uh, weigh yourself after a big high-carb dinner, like pasta, garlic bread, it's like carbonara and garlic bread is delicious and and then you have some like ice cream gelato before bed and you're like, oh, and you go to sleep and you're just like food coma out. Just massive carbohydrates. If you weigh yourself in the morning, you're probably going to weigh heavier. You will weigh heavier than if you had a low carbohydrate dinner. Like let's just say you had a, a burger, a bunless burger with lettuce instead of, instead of buns. You have lettuce. It's quite sad. Or something even better is like when you use those big mushrooms and you use them as the bun, that's low carbohydrate as well. So let's say you have one of those burgers and then uh, you snack on some almonds for dessert. Mm. Like that's pretty low carbohydrate meal. If you wake up and weigh yourself, you're going to weigh less because your glycogen stores are not going to be full of carbohydrates because you pretty much had none for dinner. You're going to weigh less. So that's a very simple way just to go, oh, is Brock talking shit? No, he's not. That was true. Okay, so maybe when I lose fat, maybe I'm not losing fat. Maybe it's just water. That's why you need to, I like to anyway, weigh yourself daily because you can see the trends. And like if at the end of the week, you weigh yourself and you've dropped weight and you've weighed yourself every day and you've seen the ups and downs, but like at the end of the week, it's lower, then that tells you that you're going in the right direction. Um, and this is why weighing yourself something like once a week can be quite dangerous for people that really care about their weight and that number has a big impact on their mental health. Because, you know, let's say they stuck to their calorie deficit the whole week. Monday and then on Sunday they go to weigh themselves and they haven't lost weight but they're like I've been in a calorie deficit all week how is this possible and they didn't weigh themselves throughout the week to see their fluctuations go up and down and then on Sunday they weigh themselves and they're like the same weight they're like this is BS Brock's a liar he doesn't know what he's talking about but on Saturday night, even if you st stuck to your calorie deficit, you had like a late dinner and you had a high carbohydrate dinner. Like you saved all your carbohydrates for that dinner. You went out, you had that pasta garlic bread meal that I just said, and then you like retain this water and your glycogen stores are full and you haven't lost weight. And you're like, man, this isn't working. So you give your diet up. But if you weighed yourself every day, you would see in between that you were actually losing weight. You just had a high carb dinner. And you're retaining water, but the next, like the next day or so, that might just like get flushed out, and then you're gonna like, and then you've dropped a kilo and a half, two kilos. You were so close, but because you only weighed yourself once at the end of the week, you don't have a an accurate picture of what's happening. So that's something to consider. So that's low carb diets. Um, for fat loss, they are, it, in my opinion, overrated, because when you drop low carbohydrates you can potentially feel a drop in productivity 
at work, you can potentially feel a drop in performance in the gym. And if you're dropping performance in the gym, let's say, and you're not lifting heavier weights, you're just like lifting the same or lifting lighter because you feel so depleted and and and, and low on energy, then you're going to like lift less weights, then you're probably going to lose muscle mass and then you're losing weight, but you're losing fat and muscle instead of like trying to maintain as much muscle as possible and just lose fat. So then your body composition deteriorates. De- deteriorates, sorry. So you, sh- I prefer to keep carbohydrates as high as possible whilst you're dieting. Still creating a calorie deficit, but you don't need to go into a low carb diet. You can stay at a high carb diet so your training is still optimal and it's still hard and you still feel good and dieting feels like less of a diet. That's the way that I prefer to do diets. Anyway, moving on. Something closely related to low carbohydrate, well, it is a low, it's an extremely low carbohydrate diet, a keto diet for fat loss. Uh, I've had friends do it. They've had great success. I've had, I look, I haven't recommended it to a client before because it just, it's, it's very unsustainable, man. One thing that many people don't know about the keto diet is it was actually created for children with epilepsy originally. It wasn't a fat loss diet. That's what happened afterwards because people (laughs) generally, when they go from a normal diet, especially these days, like a standard Western diet, which is pretty horrific to be honest, low protein, just full of processed foods, high carb, high fat. And then they go to a keto diet, which is like full of satiating dietary fat, um, some protein in there. It's still a pretty low protein diet, but it's very high in fat. It, it kind of leaves no room for the junk food that we usually eat. So when people go keto, it's often not because keto is magic. It's often because they stop eating crap. They, like McDonald's, off the menu. Domino's pizza, off the menu. Gelato ice cream, also off the menu. Sushi, maybe you can have some sashimi. But like rolls, rice balls, all the good stuff, off the menu. You can't have that food. And it's the same with the low-carbohydrate diet. When people go low-carb and they stop eating bread and they're like, man, low-carb diet is the best. It's just because you're dropping your calories. And the same thing happens with keto too. They jump on the diet. They feel pretty full because they have this like satiating dietary fat in their diet, a bit of protein, no carbohydrate. And even if they do get cravings, they can't really act upon them because when you get cravings, you don't feel like bacon and and meat, and cheese, and eggs, and nuts, and avocado, and olive oil. That would be nice wrapped in bread. That would be nice wrapped in a souvlaki. Those things are delicious, Uh, but just on their own, just protein and fat doesn't really taste the best. So often people just like eat less calories on the keto diet. So it's not really that keto is a fat loss myth. It does work, but not through the principle of the keto diet. The keto diet is just a method, but the principle behind the keto diet is that they often create a calorie deficit because they don't eat any more rubbish food. I won't spend too much longer on the keto diet because I could talk about it forever, but ultimately people just stop eating rubbish and then that makes them lose weight because they don't eat as much calories and they create a calorie deficit, which is all what it comes back to. Next, the vegan diet. A lot of people pursue the vegan diet to to lose weight, and it's often successful for the same reasons as the keto diet. The vegan diet is pretty restrictive. There are like there are a lot of things on the vegan diet that are uh, like let's say rubbish foods, like there's vegan donuts, there's vegan muffins, not saying they're rubbish foods, they're delicious, but you know, like not the most nutrient dense foods. Like you can get takeout, takeout burgers, like you can go to grilled, which is a burger joint and you can get like the impossible burger and stuff like that. I've never had one. I'm not interested at all because I'd way rather like rip into a Wagyu beef patty, but some people are vegan and I appreciate and acknowledge that. Um, and they get that sort of stuff. They get the impossible burger and and, and all that from grilled. Um, so there is still like junk food that you can have as a vegan, but it is reduced. And often when people go from a normal standard Western diet to a vegan diet, they make better nutritional decisions or for this 
fat loss myth episode of the podcast, they make lower calorie decisions. If you go on a vegan diet and you just pretty much eat vegetables, vegetables are very low in calories. Fruit, very low in calories. So if you go from a diet where you're eating things that are high in calories, let's say, let's just say you have like burgers every now and then, you might have pizza every now and then, hot chips every now and then, like you could still do that as a vegan, like, you know, there's different options. Uh, But like, let's say you're like, eating vegetables and fruit like a, you know, like a really hunter-gatherer type vegan. And you eat berries and you eat chickpeas and you eat, you know, like vegetable stir fries and stuff like that. The calories are extremely low. And quite a lot of vegans are very, very skinny because they, they literally like, with vegetables and fruit, they have such a high amount of fiber that you feel full and it literally prevents you from eating more. When your fiber is very high, if you just like keep eating and push through it, like your stomach is so full of fiber, it can feel like crampy and you can be like, oh, I feel like blur. So you just don't eat and you like fill up on these lower calories because the fiber's high. And the, and the good thing is, is like these are nutrient dense foods. So you're getting good micronutrients and, and things like that. In the vegan diet, although there are some deficiencies that because they don't consume animal products that they are prone to. But we're not going to talk about that in the podcast. We're talking about fat loss today. So they do often lose fat on the vegan diet. But it is through a calorie deficit. Surprise, surprise. It is through a calorie deficit. It's not because the vegan diet is magical. It's not because uh, a vegan unicorn come and blesses you and says, yes, you can lose fat now. Go and be vegan and, and lose fat. That is not what happens. When you go vegan, you often just start consuming a lower calorie diet and you lose weight. It's that simple. Intermittent fasting. When you are intermittent fasting, you... You have a specific eating window to eat within. The most common lean gains method is eating for eight hours per day, not not eight hours straight. Like you have an eating window of eight hours per day and you fast for 16 hours. So most commonly you would eat from midday to 8 p.m. and then you would stop eating from 8 p.m. You'd do whatever you do. You'd go to sleep. You'd wake up. You'd skip breakfast and then you'd start eating at lunch. That's what a lot of people will do. And that's the most common method. And the reason that people lose fat in the intermittent fasting method is often people talk a lot about uh, ketosis. They also talk about the benefits of intermittent fasting with autophagy, which can actually just be replicated in a calorie deficit. But anyway... With intermittent fasting, when you are fasting, you're skipping a meal. Most people in the world will eat breakfast. It's becoming a bit more common that people will skip breakfast, but most people eat breakfast, go to work, like have a snack, have lunch, have another snack, eat dinner, maybe have dessert, question mark, maybe gelato, delicious, and then go to sleep. So if we just like had that same template of like waking up, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, question mark on dessert. If we just cut out breakfast and a snack, and then we just had lunch, snack, dinner, and then no dessert, you've now gone from six meals to three meals. That is how they lose weight. They eat less calories. Surprise. That is the power of intermittent fasting. Some people claim that they feel better and I'm not going to take that away from them. If if someone feels better eating between 12 to 8 and not eating outside of that, that's completely fine. You do you. I'm not against it. I'm not against intermittent fasting at all. I've even recommended it to some clients because it's just a method. But the thing that grinds my gears is when people push intermittent fasting and they're so passionate about it, like you need to do it because you're going to lose fat. That's not the truth. You might not lose fat because you can still gain weight if you have three meals per day. You can just have three very high calorie meals that throws your calories over maintenance into a surplus and you gain body fat. 
But if you have six meals and then without changing anything, you just have three, you've just dropped breakfast, you've dropped a snack and you've dropped dessert. That could be anywhere between 500 to 1,000 calories. If you drop 500 to 1,000 calories per day from your diet to this new intermittent fasting diet, of course you're going to lose body fat or just stop gaining fat. This is the power of intermittent fasting. And often this is accompanied by a black coffee in the morning or a tea if some people are into it. Because, you know, you can still have like low calorie foods or no calorie foods, drinks, black coffee, green tea, this type of stuff in the morning still to help tie you over until your first meal. It does... I would say open people's eyes up to the fact that they don't actually need to eat breakfast. Like often we wake up and we're like, man, I'm so starving. I have to eat breakfast, man, or I'm going to be so slow. And then like you try intermittent fasting, you realize, oh, I actually feel pretty fine. Like I think it was just a a thing that I told myself or a thing that was pushed on me like breakfast. Yeah, the most important meal of the day. Is it really? Is it the most important meal of the day? question mark maybe maybe not for some people not for others i think the most important meal of the day is all of them combined and how many calories you consume you know you can have a great breakfast but a terrible lunch and dinner and screw up your whole day in terms of your calories it doesn't really matter like you know there's an idea that it's like you know there's no bad foods or there's no bad meals there's just bad diets And that's kind of how I like to look at things, like a sum approach. And that's how most things work in the world, like at work. It's not really like what you achieve in one day. It's what you achieve over the week or over the month or over the year. Because you can bust your ass Monday to Wednesday and then just burn out. And then Thursday to Sunday, you just do nothing. And like the person that just like chipped away every day and just like worked just like averagely hard between Monday to Friday, took the weekend off. They might surpass you because over the week, they did more work than you and they were more productive and you just like went too hard too early. It's the same thing. Okay. We're now going to talk about cardio for fat loss. A lot of people will say cardio helped me lose fat. You got to do cardio. You, you, you know, you have to get your steps up. That kind of falls into your neat levels, but let's just call it cardio for this. You got to start running. Running helped me lose fat, man. You should run. You need to run. Or cycling. You should cycle. You should swim. You should row. You should do the Stairmaster 30 minutes a day on a three speed with a, you know, three incline. That's how you lose fat, bro. That's what a lot of people will tell you because that's how they do it. And if you didn't know, that is called the confirmation bias because, um, it's kind of like confirmed their their beliefs, like what they've gone through. So a lot of people say, yeah, man, keto is the best diet or like you have to do cardio to lose fat, man. You got to do that because like they may have thought that and then they did that themselves and then it just confirmed what they thought. And that confirmation bias is like really strong in the fitness world. Things work for them and then they just preach it until their ears fall off and It's not very good because everyone is different. Everyone likes different things. Everyone has different genetics. Everyone has different preferences. I don't like cardio. Some people do cardio and lose a lot of weight. My friend back in New Zealand, Dan, he's been running marathons. And when I first met him, we were studying in jazz school. And he's leaner now because of running. He runs, he does marathons, half marathons. Now he started running with his wife, which is awesome. And I think he's much healthier for it. He loves cardio. I used to run with him for a while. I thought I liked cardio. And then for me, I saw the light and I started lifting weights. I was lifting weights the entire time, but I really loved, I really got into lifting weights. And then I started jujitsu a couple of years ago. And I really love that too. That's my light. But people will say you have to do cardio to lose fat. And the the reason that people think that that it works is because they start doing cardio uh, and they start adding that onto everything that they do. So maybe they go from not running to running. They go from doing zero runs per week to doing three runs per week. Uh, or they go from like lifting weights four times a week to lifting weights four times a week still and adding in two runs and then resting on Sunday, let's say. And then they lose weight and they go, man, cardio helps. 
And the thing is, similar to intermittent fasting, they've just added on extra cardio to what they normally do. So they eat the same, they train the same weights wise, but then they just start running and that's like extra calories. So let's say they burn 500 calories a run. Now they're doing two a week. That's an extra thousand calories. So over the week, they're burning an extra thousand calories. And even though that's not that much over the week, it's still enough potentially to get their weight start dropping. Um, So people will think, man, this cardio thing is helping me lose fat. This is what's working. A lot of bodybuilders will post about like doing cardio or doing steps on the treadmill or doing the doing the stairmaster. Cardio helps keep me fit. The main role that cardio is playing is increasing your physical activity. It's increasing your calorie output. And when we increase our calorie output, we 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 start shifting the scales a bit. Let's say we're not losing weight. We're at maintenance. As soon as we start increasing our calorie expenditure, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, it starts to get above our calorie intake. And when our calorie expenditure, all the calories that we burn throughout the day is higher than how much we consume, this creates a discrepancy between the two, which we have identified as a calorie deficit. So now that we're doing cardio, we now have a calorie deficit and we start losing fat. Once again, it's not because of the cardio. That is a method to lose fat. It's the principle behind burning more calories than we consume, creating a calorie deficit. That is how cardio works as a tool to lose fat. So just doing cardio. Yeah, cardio makes you lose fat. That is a myth. But it isn't a myth in the way that it can help increase your calorie expenditure to help you create a calorie deficit to then help you lose fat. When I first thought of doing a podcast in 2019, I wrote down everything that I wanted to achieve with the show. And one thing I never wrote down was to spam you with ads of products that I never really used myself. However, I did write down that I wanted to grow it as big as possible and have as many interesting people on the show as I could. To help make that happen, all I ask is that you leave a review on the podcast platform that you're listening to this episode on and share it with someone that you know it will benefit. If you want to support myself even further and more importantly your body transformation and are interested in having me as your coach to help you achieve the results that you just can't seem to achieve on your own, you can visit teamrockashby.com to see what program fits you best. Back to the show. I've seen a few ads around eating to your body type and someone famous for this, and f- I'm saying famous not in a good way. He's a joke in the fitness industry. His name is Vishred. You may have seen him pop up on YouTube ads. Like, are you eating toward your body type? That's my attempt at a, an American accent. Please forgive me. And he goes on to talk about if your body type's this, you need to eat like this. If your body type is like this, then you can't eat this, but you must eat this because that's what works for your body type. Um, and uh, this just isn't true. This just isn't backed in, backed by science. This has actually been disproven. There are no body types like we used to think. Um, you know, they're called somatic body types. We used to think like, you know, mesomorph and endomorph and 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 ectomorph and that like that is a way i guess to categorize different bodies it's an okay way of saying okay this person's probably that this person's probably this you know an ectomorph is someone that's generally skinny struggles to gain weight a mesomorph is someone usually with broader shoulders builds muscle quite easily um you know loses fat kind of easily not as fast as an ectomorph and then an endomorph is someone that just like carries a bit more weight, is a bit more rounder in shape, uh, a bit more overweight, struggles to lose weight. Um, Like that was the kind of understanding of somatic body types. And then people just started just, just making it even worse. Like if you are this body type, you need to eat like this. And I kind of learned that when I was first learning personal training and then it got disproven and we were like, no, 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 that doesn't matter. The same things work for everyone. Like a calorie deficit to lose weight works for an endomorph, ectomorph, and a mesomorph. The principle is the same. The law of thermodynamics still apply to each person. The way that their body responds may be different, but the principle still applies. 
So if someone ever says like you have to eat according to your body type, just just look at them in the eye and say, that is stupid. And that's how you get away from that. And then just end the conversation and walk away. The, the last point before I actually acknowledge the best way to lose fat is spot reduction because, you know, there are people that would s- still believe that you can, and this really isn't, let's say this is a side note to fat loss, but with fat loss, a lot of people think that you can spot reduce fat in certain areas. The most commonly the abdomen, the abdominals, people think that if, if they if they do sit-ups, if they do a lot of crunches, if they do a lot of hanging leg raises, that that's going to help them lose fat on their belly because they're doing uh, like abs, ab exercises, and that's where your belly is. So if I do exercises for this area and I crunch and I do all these things, that should help me lose fat in that area. And that's just not true. It sounds good. Man, it sounds good. Like imagine if you just did crunches and then you just had abs and less fat, or you just did bicep curls and then like your arms just got leaner and your muscles just got bigger. That would be awesome. And I think if that was true, most people would be jacked because it'd be so easy to do. But that's not how it works, unfortunately. Spot reduction has been disproven in the research a few times. Like there's been studies where people do sit-ups and then they measure their body fat and all that kind of stuff. And and it just comes back like, sorry, man, doesn't really work like that. Here's how it works. We do exercises in the gym to build muscle in those areas. The way that we lose body fat is by creating a calorie deficit. Would you know? Would you look at that? And a really good way to explain this is if you have a swimming pool and you're on the left side of the swimming pool and you and you grab a bucket and you take it from the left side, like you're on the left side of the pool, you, you grab a bucket of water and you just throw it out. So you're emptying the pool out and you just keep going on the left side and you do three and then you do four and then you do five. And let's just say you do a hundred scoops and you take about a hundred, I don't know, 200 liters out of the pool and you throw it to the left. When you look at the pool, is there going to be less water on the left side or is it going to evenly come down? If you guessed the second (laughs) answer, you are correct. Because the pool is just going to lower and lower and lower and lower. No matter where you take the scoop of water from with your bucket, the water's just going to go down evenly everywhere. And that's what happens when we lose body fat. When we create a calorie deficit, we lose body fat everywhere. It disperses. And genetically, we do store body fat in different areas. I store less on my stomach. That's why I generally have lean abs. And I store most on my glutes and my legs. That's why I struggle to get my legs to look muscular or look toned or look defined, however you want to say it, to look shredded. My legs are really hard to do that because they store most of my body fat, but my arms and my upper body don't. And this is a side note, but that's why I look lean quite a lot. Because if I take my shirt off, I look like it. This sounds very arrogant, but like it looks impressive because I don't carry much body fat in my upper body. Um, But if I had the same body fat and let's say I stored it all on my upper body and less in my legs, I'd have really lean legs and my upper body would look less impressive because more fat would be there. And we can't control where we store our body fat with our genetics, but we can control how much fat we do have, which is kind of like we can control how much water we have in the pool. We can't determine where we lose the water in the pool, if that makes sense. So here's here's how to do it. Instead of like, instead of wondering oh, can I spot reduce here? I'm going to do crunches and then I'm going to lose fat on my abs. I'm going to do chest press machine and that's going to help me lose fat on my chest. It's not. It's not going to. But if you do muscle, uh, sorry, if you do exercises for certain muscles, those exercises are going to help build muscle in that area. And, And that's what working out, that's what lifting weights is for. It's to build muscle in certain areas. Working out is not for dropping body fat. 
It, it may happen. It may contribute to that. But the primary reason that we should be lifting weights is to build muscle or to maintain muscle whilst we're trying to lose weight. And not spot reducing, like, because it's not going to happen. But what can happen if you're like, if you train chest like three times a week and you start building muscle in your chest and it starts looking a bit juicier and you're getting stoked with it. And then you get into a calorie deficit and you lose body fat and just like taking, you know, scoops of water out of the pool and like your body fat just goes down everywhere. Just like evenly. It will look like you spot reduced body fat in your chest, but really what happened is you maintained or built muscle in your chest and you just lost body fat everywhere and it just so happened that your chest is on your body. So you started to store less fat on your chest. You built muscle in your chest and you lost fat in your chest and everywhere else. And then that has like that is how it potentially helped you look better or hit your goals of having a more impressive chest. So that's how it works, folks. Spot reduction, it's rubbish. It's been disproven many times before, but I just wanted to clarify that for you because a lot of people still think that. They still think that you should do crunches to lose, you know, belly fat. They think that you should, you know, do squats to lose leg fat, Uh, do, you know, tricep pushdowns to lose tricep fat. It doesn't work like that. You build muscle with exercises and you lose fat with your diet. Now, I'm going to close the podcast. This is what we've all been waiting for. Dun, 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 dun. The best way to lose fat, in my opinion, the Team Brock Ashby way. The best way to lose fat is to utilize nutrition to create a calorie deficit. I've said it so many times. Your ears are probably bleeding calorie deficit by now. But that's how you lose body fat. There's no other way to dress it up and make it sexy. People have tried with all the methods that I've talked about today. High reps, low weight, low carb, keto, vegan, intermittent fasting, cardio, eating according to your body type, spot reduction. They're all ways of saying you need to create a calorie deficit to drop body fat. So that's how I would do it. Through your nutrition, don't try and out-exercise yourself. Like don't go, oh, I'm going to start losing fat. I'm going to, instead of lifting weights just five days a week, I'm going to do seven days a week. Because those extra two gym sessions, you're not going to burn a ton of calories in them. You're better off just eating a bit less and sticking to the same schedule that you have lifting wise now. That's going to be much more effective. It's easier to cut calories than it is to burn calories. Like, (laughs) you could try doing this. Think of how long it takes you to eat a Big Mac. For me, I could do a Big Mac in under three minutes, for sure. A Big Mac is 500 calories. For me to burn 500 calories in three minutes is impossible. It'd take me running for about an hour to do that. Or working out for an hour and a half, maybe two hours to burn 500 calories. It's so much easier to consume calories than it is to burn calories. So instead of consuming those calories, deduct them. So instead of trying to burn an extra 500 calories, just don't eat the 500 calories. It takes discipline. It's not sexy at all. Brock, why are you telling me this? This is stupid. That means I have to have discipline. Exactly. That's why I'm telling you because it's the best way to do it. And this is how I have successfully finished the Built by Brock 8-week challenge last week. And I lost 4.1 kg in eight weeks. And my goal was four kilos. I lost 4.1. So I exceeded it just by 100 grams. And how did I do it? I just had discipline. Instead of trying to, I I didn't exercise more. I didn't go, oh man, I got eight weeks to lose fat. Instead of training five days a week, I'm going to train, you know, seven and just like not rest and just train real hard. I didn't do that. That's not the wise way to do it. Do you know what I did? It's really lame. It's really easy. My maintenance, I took 200 calories off and then I just ate that for about four weeks. My maintenance is 3,500 calories. I had 3,300 calories for four weeks. It hardly felt like I was dieting. Then for the last four weeks, maybe three weeks, I consumed 3,100. I made the calorie deficit even less. I took another 200 off and I ate 3,100 calories. Still didn't really feel like I was dieting. Like there are a few things that I limited myself with, but like 
3,100 calories is a ton of food. I still felt, and, and it's only a 400 calorie deficit daily for the last three weeks. It wasn't sexy, but it was consistent. It was a grind. It was just that those daily wins and that consistency, that discipline that I had. And I ended up losing four kilos in eight weeks. I hit my goal, which is cool because that's what I wanted to do. So the first thing that I would do, the best way to lose fat is to create a calorie deficit through your nutrition. With your training, keep it the same. Keep it exactly the same. Lift heavy. You can do three reps whilst you're trying to lose fat. I did it a ton. Three reps, four reps, five reps, six reps. That's heavy weight. You're in the strength rep range there. And people think, oh, but like, was that hard? You're in a calorie deficit and like lifting heavy? No, it wasn't hard. I just did it. Discipline, folks. This is what it takes. Still lift heavy weights close to failure. You can still do Reps like 15, 20, 25, 30. I just find in a calorie deficit, especially because you're in a deficit of energy, doing heaps of reps is a lot harder because you're you're like you're gassing yourself out. You're you are slightly exerting more calories. I like to just stay in those low rep ranges, still lift heavy, still give my muscles a stimulus to stick around and maintain, and then drop body fat through my nutrition. So that is I think the best way to lose fat, in my opinion, the Team Brock Ashby way. Another thing I'll add on to this is steps. I kept my steps at a minimum of 10,000. And that helps to burn calories too, by increasing your NEAT levels or just increasing your physical activity in general. If you go from doing 8,000 steps a day and then you're doing fat loss and now you bump it up to 10,000 per day, you're now burning more calories throughout the day, every single day. And that is an extra 2,000 steps a day. That's an extra 14,000 steps per week. I don't know how many calories that is for you, but that's more calories than it was before. So because you've bumped up your calorie expenditure or how much physical activity you're doing, you're most probably going to help create a calorie deficit and lose body fat more successfully. So increasing your step count can be another great way to, to help yourself to lose fat. One last thing I'll say is sleep. So sleep is where we recover. Sleep is often, you know, not just for our physical recovery, but it's also for our cognitive function for our daily lives. Like we have work, we have children, we have, you know, things to do throughout the day that we want to feel, feel competent at and being well slept definitely helps with that. It helps you to be more positive, more optimistic too. So I, I will add that in because not many people will say, oh, for fat loss, you need to sleep. Yeah, you do. Because it doesn't sound hardcore. Like, it's hardcore if you get up early, you're like, nah, man, I only slept four hours. I'm just going to train because I'm hard. But the stupid thing is, is that is unsustainable. That's not the best way to recover. Your workouts are probably going to be dog shit. It's just not, like, it sounds cool. It sounds hardcore. It sounds like you're better than me. But really, you're, like, you're going to fizzle out and your body's not going to operate optimally with that so just make sure you get seven to nine hours of sleep and that is how i like to coach losing fat creating creating a calorie deficit through through your nutrition is the most intelligent way to do things continually training heavy weights close to failure increasing your step count or maintaining a high step count can help by increasing your calorie expenditure It kind of like tags off the back of doing cardio. I just like to look at it as doing extra steps. But if you can't get extra steps and you're like, oh, but Brock, I can cycle or swim or I can run, then yeah, it'd probably technically be more so cardio, but just increasing physical activity can help. And also making sure you're well slept. Seven to nine hours is a really good ballpark figure to aim for. You know, I'm struggling to hit that at the moment as a parent, as a, I should say as a fresh parent because, you know, but anyway. You get what I'm trying to say. Going to wrap up the podcast there. Thank you for listening. This is episode number 46. Episode number 47 is going to be muscle building myths. And that is coming right up. Thank you for listening.